Ben, thank you for taking time to share your knowledge with us this morning. And I'm ready to put your slide presentation on whenever you tell me. Go ahead, sir. Okay, you can put the first slide up if you like. Okay. Let me begin by thanking the North Shore Senior Center for the opportunity to lead this presentation today. Many thanks to Ron Montaigne for inviting me and to my good friend Linda O'Connor for planting the idea in my head originally and to Jill Becker for facilitating. I could be preaching to the choir and telling any Midwesterner about William McKinley and Many recent talks, almost all virtual, of course, I've often found it necessary to explain in advance why William McKinley is worth remembering. Most well-educated Americans remember only a few facts about our 25th president. Your presence here today tells me you probably know more about him than most, or at least have more curiosity about him than most. I suspect that uh, much of the details in my most recent book, Forgotten Legacy, published at the end of 2020, will surprise even those of you who think you know him very well. There was a hidden side to President McKinley, things he was privately proud of but refused to call attention to even during his campaigns for the White House in 1896 and 1900. He was quite simply a very private man Ron, you can hit the next slide if you like. Okay. As private as he was, he was also an extraordinarily popular man. He drew large crowds wherever he went to speak between 1897 and 1901, including one overflow crowd in October 1899, more than 3,000 Sunday worshipers and others, at one of Chicago's largest black churches, Quinn Chapel AME Church. At his last public speech in Buffalo in September 1901, the day before he was shot, he drew at least 50,000 people who wanted to hear what he had to say about the Pan-American future at the Pan-American Exposition. But how many of you know that that address had been postponed from three months earlier. The last stop after a planned address or planned trip across the Southern and Western United States would have been the longest goodwill tour by any president to that date and one of the longest in history or the reason why it was halted early in June. Not surprisingly, because of his wife's health. Ida McKinley almost died from a blood infection while they were in California. She was not even expected to make it home. They were planning to turn their special train into a funeral train to take her body back to Washington. She recovered miraculously from a radical procedure where they injected saline solution directly into her heart to restart it. And she was able to uh, come back to a reasonable facsimile of health for her. And she lived for another six years after that. But he did not expect her to, to make it home alive. And he was overjoyed when she was revived and brought back. Ron, you can go to the next slide now, if you like. But by saving his wife's life, that delay may have actually cost McKinley his own life because Leon Shawgosh decided at the last moment to go to Buffalo in September after reading about the president's rescheduled travel plans. He might not have even seen news about the June speech and might never have come to Buffalo to carry out his own plans. Like any self-respecting former college teacher, I can't pass up the chance for a virtual pop quiz. No grade. What's the first thing you remember about our 25th president? You don't have to answer, but think it to yourself. If you said shot in Buffalo, you're among the majority, won the Spanish-American War as a close second, 
if you answered six-term congressman and governor of Ohio, go to the head of the class. And if you said almost elected House Speaker and gerrymandered out of his safe district by Democratic legislators, you can teach my next course. First of all, this is one of the most famous pictures, photographs of William McKinley. And you may not recognize the man sitting with it. So I'm going to ask you if you happen to know, this is part two of the pop quiz, who his vice president was. And if you say Teddy Roosevelt, you're half right, but you know that's not Teddy Roosevelt. This is a man named William, um, excuse me, Augustus Hobart, called Gus. He was president for half of William McKinley's first term until he died very unexpectedly of heart failure after a long illness. But William McKinley was very attached to Gus Hobart, was a New Jersey banker who served in the state Senate, didn't know him before he ran for president, but became very uh, closely allied with him. And he would play an important part in McKinley's administration. He was the first vice president to be called the assistant. And he was the last for nearly a hundred years to perform that task. Before then, the vice president's job had been um, so undemanding and so um, overshadowed by the president that people can't even tell you the names of most of the vice presidents, except those who became president by accident. What happened to Gus Hobart happened at a very critical time for the kinds of events that I talk about in my book. If you know much about William McKinley, you know that he grew up in Ohio. He was raised by abolitionist parents, and he believed very strongly in uh, freedom for uh, enslaved people in the South. He actually dropped out of college after he, uh, becoming ill and then enlisted in the Union Army and fought to free black slaves. He and his wife were a very avant-garde in, in many ways. He believed women's suffrage, although he could not push it through Ohio as early as he liked. And he even invited, he and his wife invited uh, Victoria Woodhull to their and, uh, when she was running for president. He was, let's see, other things about him you might not know. He began life as a junior, dropped it later on in life. The very short Spanish-American War happened on watch, if against his wishes. He was, in fact, the third president to be murdered in just 36 years, Lincoln, Garfield, and McKinley. And his portrait is still on the $500 bill, which was uh, first produced in 1928. Still legal currency, but you don't see many of them. Of course, he might be much more familiar if his portrait had stayed on the $10 bill where it started in 1902. Ron, you can go to the next slide now. McKinley had a cabinet like any president, and this is a picture taken of him in his cabinet room. But this is actually the room that he's in is McKinley's private office. He gave it up to make it the cabinet room and turned his private office into a waiting room because he had so many visitors. He was among the most accessible and most popular with crowds, presidents in American history. One of the problems with this is that this room and the ones around it were up on the second floor in the east wing. They had not built the west wing at this time. And you had to go up a very creaky staircase to get to the rooms and still people even these old congressmen 
wheezing up the stairs because there was only one elevator in the White House, but that was in the private quarters, would come up and sit sometimes by the dozens to wait to meet the president. He would also receive larger crowds downstairs because they just couldn't get that many into the room. But one of the things that you might find, I found interesting anyway, you can tell I'm a historian because I get carried away by little details that nobody else remembers or cares about. But he would entertain large crowds of African-American leaders, including the same week that he was sworn in in 1887, he had a visit by a group of uh, black journalists who were meeting in Washington at the time, and he invited them over. About two dozen members of the Afro-American Press Association, including men like W. Calvin Chase, John Dancy, uh, Dr. Samuel Courtney, Jesse Lawson, Professor Richard Greener, Jackson McHenry, a, a group of very distinguished men, most of whose names you've probably never heard, but he wanted them to come. So he invited them. He said it was Saturday. He'd been sworn in on uh, the Monday before. That please come over and talk to me. Tell me what's on your mind, what's going on. Calvin Chase, who published a newspaper in Washington, D.C., wrote several days later about the visit. He said, last Saturday noon, the members of the Afro-American Press Association of the United States met at the offices of the Washington Bee, his paper. Editor Chase informed the members that he'd arranged with the president to meet the members between 4 and 5 p.m. So they went to Secretary Porter's private office. That was um, John Addison Porter, who was McKinley's private secretary. And the head of the organization delivered this address. This is just a few words from it. The country has shown its confidence in you personally, as well as in the principles you represent, and now look forward with the bright patience for a revival of business and a return of good and prosperous times. This is not a formal meeting of the association, but in their names, I thank you most heartily for the honor done us, and again, wish you a long and happy life and a successful administration. Ron, you can go to the next slide. Try to imagine any other U.S. president, at least until Barack Obama, who would have given up so much free time on his first weekend in office, still unpacking at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue to meet with a group of black journalists he did not know. McKinley was simply unusual. Many white Republican colleagues played paid lip service to the need for a racially integrated party, but McKinley actually seemed to feel comfortable in the company of African Americans. Many Republicans did adhere to the creed of the party up to a limit, but social interaction outside the strictly defined rules of political gathering was a problem area. One of the men with whom William McKinley spent much of his time in political meetings was this man. George Henry White. He was the only African-American member of the House of Representatives during William McKinley's term, first term in office. He was elected from uh, the second district of North Carolina. It was a heavily Republican and heavily black Republican district. And he was the fourth African-American congressman from my home state between uh, 1874 and the turn of the century. He was a former teacher, former prosecutor, and a former um, solicitor. He had struck up a relationship with McKinley, hoping to uh, further the idea of appointing 
black postmaster than North Carolina. For those of you who uh, don't know, about 300 black postmasters actually served between the end of the Civil War and the uh, first decade of the 20th century. And about 100 of those were appointed by William McKinley alone. He appointed, from my count, as many black public officials, including postmasters, as all his predecessors put together. But he did it fairly quietly. He didn't always go out and talk and say, I'm going to appoint a high ranking um, black man or black woman. And there were actually more than a dozen black women who were appointed as postmistresses or postmasters. And one of the reasons I think that his friendship with George White was so natural to him was that he had already served in Congress with eight of the 18 predecessors of George White, black uh, congressmen in the U.S. House. There were a total of 20 and two senators in addition who served in the end of the 19th century. But back to George White, he was a very active conservative Republican. And he believed that if he could plant the seed of trust in William McKinley, that William McKinley would uh, return that trust and it worked. They became, if not close friends, they became good friends and good political allies. George Henry White had been a delegate at the 1896 convention that nominated McKinley. About 100 black delegates went to that particular convention in St. Louis. And during his term in office, McKinley carefully cultivated the support of all the black leaders that he could. Most of the black men who could vote at the time were Republicans across the South and in much of the North, the Democratic Party was uh, recruiting black members in Northern cities and Midwest cities like Chicago. But most of the uh, black America lived in the former Confederate states. North Carolina was one of the last who actually encouraged a large turnout by black voters. And it was winding down to the end. North Carolina would soon disfranchise most black voters after George Henry White decided not to run again. But at the time, it was a widespread practice to appoint as many uh, black officials as could be appointed, including in at state level regional offices of the federal government and treasury and other uh, departments, he appointed somewhere between, my last count was between 500 and 3,000 or allowed them to be appointed. He didn't have to appoint them all, but many of them had to be approved by Congress, including the top four, which were the ministers to Haiti, Liberia, then there was the register of the U.S. Treasury, and the last one was the recorder of deeds of the District of Columbia, which was at that time in the Interior Department. Those four uh, top four appointees were the best known of uh, any of his appointees, but there were many hundreds more below that level that weren't quite as uh, well known. George White suggested several of them to the president, including the ambassador to Liberia, who was a man, uh, a clergyman from North Carolina, George White near. Now, when, I don't mean to overstate the importance of all this, but I just want you to understand that William McKinley thought differently for most people. I never found any evidence that he invited 
uh, black Americans into his home or that he took meals with them. Although he did probably eat breakfast in Tuskegee with Booker T. Washington when he was there at the end of 1898. And he did not pub publicly advocate social equality between the races. It would have been virtual political suicide in the country at the time. Most of you might remember what happened when uh, Teddy Roosevelt invited Booker T. Washington to take a meal with him in 1901. It was quite the apocalypse had come to pass in the South. But even though he did not get too far ahead of everybody else, he was far enough ahead because he said, for instance, when he appointed more than 70 black military officers at one time, the most ever appointed in one day in uh, 1899, he said this was long overdue because black officers were considered an oddity. There weren't very many when the Spanish-American War broke out and you had to recruit many more. George White was among those who encouraged him to do just that. Ron, you can go to the next slide now. Now, I put this picture in just uh, for a plug for my first book, really. But the man on the left in the picture facing you is uh, G.K. Butterfield, who's still in Congress and represents the district that George White used to represent. And the man on the right, as you know, is a famous man from Illinois. And in 2006, uh, G.K. Butterfield contacted me and asked me if he could purchase a hundred of copies of that book of, about George White because he wanted to give them out to all the members of the Congressional Black Caucus and then Senator Barack Obama. Now, this picture was taken in uh, early 2009, just after Barack Obama became the President of the United States. And he said, Mr. President, would you mind holding this book? that I gave you a couple of years ago up for the camera. And that's where we got that. Butterfield is a um, very interesting fellow. He's a former uh, Supreme Court justice. He's about to retire from Congress after being in there almost 20 years. I think he's had all the fun he can stand to have, and I don't blame him. But he's also an amateur historian. He loves to talk about George White, and he and I have talked at several appearances together about the importance of George White, what he did, and how he set a tone for what would happen later in U.S. history. William McKinley was a man of solid principle, and he fervently believed that political equality was sacrosanct separate from social equality. He'd fought in the Civil War as a true believer in abolition. And he endorsed the unsuccessful federal elections bill of 1890. Uh, that bill passed the House by a narrow margin and died thanks to a Southern Democratic filibuster in the Senate in 1890. It would have allowed complaints against anyone administering an unfair election to be taken to federal court at the time, and it would have foregone a lot of the difficulties that were soon to plague the South, but it could not get through the Senate. Um, it was part of a trade-off by the Republican president at the time, Benjamin Harrison, who needed two other things more importantly than the bill, so he said, if you'll pass these two things, I won't say a word on the debate um, on the federal elections bill. But William McKinley, who was very disappointed by all this, soon got voted out of office after being gerrymandered out at the end of uh, 1890, believed that it would have saved the country from a lot of um, terrible r political ravages. He later ran for governor of Ohio, and 
before he became president. He served two terms there. And he was very careful to listen to the handful of small handful of black legislators in the Ohio General Assembly, even stopped a notorious attempt at mob violence aimed at lynching a convicted rapist by sending out the Ohio National Guard to Fayette County in 1894. So it was probably natural that as he began in 1895 to think about running for president, that he met repeatedly with black leaders, groups, both small and large, and listened to their advice. He went to Jacksonville, Florida, for instance, and met in uh, the spring of 1895 with a large group of black Republican leaders in his private hotel, almost unheard of. He refused to patronize hotels that barred black patrons, and he stuck up for his principles. Now, he, he did win the 1896 Republican nomination for president with the endorsement of nearly every black delegate in St. Louis, even those who had favored his opponents for the nomination. With their enthusiastic help, he won convincingly in 1900 when he ran again. He was the first sitting president to win re-election in three decades since Ulysses Grant in 1872. Ron, you can go to the next slide. Now, there were interesting newspaper stories in some papers about George White and William McKinley and their relationship. The Evening Star in Washington, D.C. was the most scrupulous about covering them. They would mention in almost every um, day's column, there was some uh, column called In the White House or At the White House or Just the White House, almost the name of almost every visitor who came to see McKinley. And they were always careful to be very deferential, but to mention any black leader who came. Now, the Washington Post was not a friend of um the cause, and they hardly ever mentioned the fact that a black man even came into the White House for any reason. My, how times change. The uh, Evening Star was a, a reasonably um, good factual newspaper. They tried to keep their editorials off the front page, other newspapers. Um, stories of editorial content. When he appointed uh, Henry Plummer Cheatham, who was coincidentally a former congressman and George White's brother-in-law, appointed him as recorder of deeds of the District of Columbia, his picture was on the front page of the Evening Star. And that was the first time that I found a black man's uh, photograph, or this is an actual an engraving on the front page of uh, any major white uh, mainstream daily in the country. George White gave advice as best he could to McKinley. He never tried to pull rank and really, of course, he could not. He was a freshman congressman and William McKinley was the most famous uh, man in the party. But they did understand each other, and I think they truly trusted each other. McKinley trusted him to give him good advice, and George White trusted that the president, once he made a promise, would not go back on it, and he rarely went back on a promise. He, wouldn't, he was the kind of man, once he made a promise, he stuck to it. One of the things that he did that it's always struck me as unusual is that he, when he fought the Spanish-American War, as I said, he encouraged black Americans to volunteer. 
and they did by the tens of thousands, including in uh, both federal volunteer regiments and in state raised regiments. And he encouraged, he overruled his own war department who said that you cannot have black officers supervising these black soldiers. It just won't work. And he said, oh, but I differ. He said, if they want, if the states want black officers uh, commanding their troops, then we will have that. And that's what happened. Many, at least three of the states, including Illinois, North Carolina, and uh, Kansas, I think, had black colonels supervising, uh, commanding their black troops. Now, none of those actually went to uh, Cuba. There were some uh, regular black troops who went. But William McKinley was a man of his word. Now, just before the Spanish-American War started, and or just before the uh, USS Maine blown up in Havana Harbor, another terrible event happened in South Carolina, and this would color the rest of William McKinley's administration. He had appoint, appointed among his first uh, 25 or 50 black postmasters, a man named uh, Frazier B. Baker as postmaster of a small town in South Carolina called Lake City. Now, Baker was a schoolmaster, and he had been a postmaster once before at a small uh, rural post office uh, a few miles up the road. Lake City was a peculiar uh, town in that it was all white. It was about four or 500 people surrounded by a black county. And they'd never had a black postmaster before. Well, they were not thrilled at the sight of a black postmaster coming to them. So they started making noise. And pretty soon you can guess what happened. He was shot at several times and then the post office was burned down, the first one that he was in, and he had to move to another one. And then a group of masked night riders came out one night and set fire to the post office and the house that he and his family were living in, shot and killed him in the doorway of his house as he tried to get out with his child, his baby in his arms and his wife and uh, five of their other children escaped but he was killed and the post office was burned down well president mckinley was horrified he said that he had the right to appoint anyone he wanted as postmaster and no one had the right to tell him otherwise so when he heard what had happened he convened a, a cabinet meeting and he said, what should we do next? What What's the best course of action to take? He turned it over to uh, a man named John W. Griggs, who had just been appointed as um, attorney general, former governor of New Jersey, and a friend of Gus Hobart's, and said, you take it on from here. And there began the history of the first widely publicized uh, trial for a lynch mob in South Carolina. It, it took a year to put the uh, trial together. And as you might guess, it ended in a hung jury, but it proved to me that William McKinley was not going to give up. He was going to try. And apparently from the reports that were made public at the time, at least 11 members in, on one count, 11 members of the jury voted to convict at least one of the defendants. There were 13 defendants who were tried. Part of the problem was that because they were masked, no one could truly identify them. And I think that's what stuck in the mind of that one. But it was the closest that, that anyone ever came for many, many years in the South of actually convicting anyone of killing a black man. 
William McKinley, I think at that point, didn't throw up his hands, but he was um, very disappointed. George White was even more disappointed. You can go to the next slide now, Ron. Yeah, I, I apologize for the slowness of our ability to move the slides there. They're freezing a little bit, Ben, but I think ah. we're good. Now, just so we know, um, we know that you know so much about this. We want to just remind us that we've got about a half hour or less to, yep. to cover the rest and Q&A. But go ahead, sir. I, I appreciate that. I, I warned you that I would get carried away and start ad living, and there you go. Right. I'm just that's why your student. You. That's why your student wanted to remind you of that, sir. <laughs> exactly. I'm just glad my dog hasn't started barking again. The mail has been delivered, and I closed the curtain so we can't see people walking by. There are several uh, of McKinley's appointees. You can uh, show this slide and then go to the next one as well who were uh, well known. And I wanted you to see this picture of the uh, USS Maine's uh, baseball team. It was it won the Navy's um, version of the World Series in 1898, just before the, um, the ship was bombed. They had a black pitcher and he was one of 36, I think it was 36 black sailors who were on the main. That's the main above in the picture. You can go to the next slide. And these are more of uh, the advisors to William McKinley. Just very quickly in the upper left corner is uh, Benjamin Arnett, who was a, a church leader, who was considered the most powerful uh, black man at the White House or in, the, in the McKinley administration. The man at the bottom is Blanche Bruce who had been a former U.S. Senator from Mississippi and became the, the Register of the Treasury um, for the first few months of William McKinley's administration. The man on the right is uh, John Roy Lynch, who was a former congressman from uh, Mississippi and was a very close friend of uh, the president's. And he actually served as a paymaster in the Spanish-American War Army. You can go to the next slide now. This is William McKinley speaking or watching parade in Tuskegee, Alabama in uh, December, 1898. Booker T. Washington's famous institute was, uh, he was hosting uh, the president to a breakfast while he was on his peace tour of the South after the war ended. You can go to the next one. if it will come. <laughs> These are more of his um, appointees. And Robert Smalls, who's famous for other reasons, is up in the upper left corner. Um, I can't see. Uh, Mifflin Gibbs was consul in uh, Madagascar, then called, uh, and let's see, what was the city called? And it's called Antana Norivo now. And this John Mercer Lynch, well, um, John Mercer Langston, was a former congressman who declined to be appointed and died very soon after McKinley was um, inaugurated. You can go to the next one. Now, that's W. Calvin Chase on the left. On the right is uh, Big Jim Parker, who actually uh, didn't mention earlier about tell you just a little bit about him he actually was at the temple of music at the buffalo uh, pan american exposition he tackled the shooter this guy was like six six and about 250 pounds and he was looking for a job as a waiter and he was right behind leon shaw gosh and as soon as he heard the second shot he jumped on him to keep him from firing a third shot and that's what saved his life that day. But he was very quickly written out of history. This is, um, you can go back to the next one. This is Henry Plummer Cheatham, who was uh, uh, George White's brother-in-law and the recorder of deeds. You can hit the next one. 
that's Fraser Baker, and that's uh, the postmaster who was killed. That's his wife and surviving children in the upper. And there's a, a big um, historical marker in Lake City, South Carolina, about the lynching of Fraser Baker. So it's well remembered now. It's been 124 years, but uh, never been forgotten. You can go to the next one now. Uh, this is a scene from Wilmington, North Carolina. I didn't talk about this. But this was uh, a racial massacre that occurred just after the election in 1898 in November. This was the former black newspaper, the Daily Record, and the white crowd that marched through City Hall and overthrew the elected Republican government in the country's only coup d'etat burned down the black newspaper and ran Alexander Manley out of town. He was allowed to get out alive. You can go to the next one. This is um, Alexander Walters, who was head of the National Afro-American Council, which was a large, uh, the first large national civil rights organization, precursor of the NAACP. And on the right is Ida B. Wells, Barnett, who actually met with the president after Frazier Baker's uh, murder and asked him to intervene, if he could, in a very complicated uh, political dance. She could not get George White to take his bill out to let her uh, Illinois delegation introduce a, the same bill to give money to the widow and children. And as a consequence, the war broke out immediately and it was lost and they never died from the government. You can go to the next one. Um, Minnie Cox, probably the most famous black female postmaster appointed in Indianola, Mississippi. And she served under uh, three presidents and was finally um, driven out of office, I guess is the only way to put it. And Teddy Roosevelt, who she was serving under in uh, her third president, closed the post office. He, he tried to talk her out of resigning. She says, I can't stay here, Mr. President. He said, well, then I'll close the post office because I want you staying there. Anyway, the picture below is President McKinley addressing a crowd in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1901, just before he, uh, just after he was inaugurated for his second term. I'll ask one final question, uh, pop quiz. Can anybody tell me what president spoke at the most black colleges in the United States? If you say William McKinley, you're right. But do you know what the first one was? I showed you earlier, it was um, Tuskegee Institute. This is at Southern University in New Orleans. It is no longer, no longer exists. There was a, a, another Southern University that exists elsewhere, but this was a very popular uh, city for black colleges. If you go one, hit the next slide. This is um, what's now called Savannah State University. It was run by um, a man named Richard Wright. He spoke there the same time that he spoke in Tuskegee, 1898. And you can hit the next one. This is um, what's now called a Texas A&M. It's in Prairie View, Texas. Not the big Texas A&M, but it's a Texas A&M Prairie View. And he spoke there after he spoke at Southern University. So he actually spoke at four different black colleges, which I, I don't think any president had ever done, and I'm not sure how many have done since. One more slide, please. This is Quinn Chapel uh, Church in Chicago, where he spoke in October 1899. And I think there's one more slide after this. I don't know. Yeah, this was a, a picture of 
a photo of McKinley receiving the uh, nomination sent to him by a formal committee. And there are four black members of the committee who came from St. Louis to Canton. I think that may be the last slide. Keep going. No, this is a picture of him um, addressing the crowd the day before he was shot in Buffalo. Next slide. This is uh, a famous rendering of McKinley being shot. And you see the man right behind the man with the gun. That's a big Jim Parker, who was, as I said, quickly written out of history. Keep going. How does he pronounce his name? Uh, Leon? Shawgosh. Shawgosh. Thank you. Ben. Yeah, it doesn't look like that. It's C-Z-O-L-G-O-S-C, -O -O but it's um, that's how it was pronounced at the time. And he was, we can talk about that later, or you can find out more about him, but he was tried very quickly and executed, and his body was dissolved in acid after uh, McKinley's death. Wow. They, they didn't uh, waste any time back then. Okay, I think the next slide just shows the $500 bill. A friend of mine sent me a McKinley um, lapel button and a McKinley uh, spoon. He said, I needed to see those things, have something to connect me to McKinley. And I think that's the end of my slides. Uh, ben, he didn't send you a $500 bill? <laughs> no, <laughs> I wish. Ben, we could pick your brains for, you know, two hours uh, and, and we would only scratch the surface. So that was fascinating. I know that uh, Don Packard has a wonderful question. I'm going to hold off on that until we see what the auditorium may have in the way of okay. questions. And I have a couple as well, too. But thank you. That was so interesting because we, we don't know much about any of what you just said. Uh, so at least I didn't. Thank you so much. Uh, sure. Auditorium, what have you got going over there? None in the auditorium. Take it away. Okay, if there are others, we can come back. Uh, we've got a few minutes, and, and I, I think this is really a great question from Don Packard. So let me read it to you. What was in the growing up of McKinley that made him embrace black civil rights ahead of most other politicians? I think it was his parents. They were ardent abolitionists. Uh, Ohio, for those of you who know much about Ohio uh, history, was a, a, a hotbed of black abolitionism or white abolitionism against black slavery. There weren't that many black slaves in Ohio uh, before it became a state, I don't think. And they always prided themselves on, on um, being fair. They some of the first um, black legislators in the country, I think, were elected in Ohio. And his parents simply, they were Methodists, and Methodists were um, tended to be very much opposed to slavery, very ardent abolitionists. They raised their son as they did. He had, uh, I think, six, seven, eight brothers and sisters. All of them were raised that way. And he, he'd gone to college early. And he was, he was uh, went in 1860, I think, and got sick, had to come home. I think he went somewhere in New York and had to come home and recuperated and immediately joined um, the Union Army and rose to become, um, he was always called Major because he was, um, I think he was actually a, may have been a, a battlefield general, but he was better known as Major. Uh, thank you. Uh, that was a great, great question, uh, Don. Thank you. Um, okay, I have, a, I have a couple questions. Um, just to pick your brains more as a historian, someone that, sure. that, that knows this period better than we do. How was the presidency looked at in those days? In other words, how did people perceive the president and how might that be different than today, the presidency? The presidency itself as an office. And, yeah. Well, you know, it really, it took on the character of the person who held the office 
I think, in more ways uh, at the time, it was not considered to be an office for activists. Uh, he was probably the most active president of the 19th century, and he's been called <clears throat> by one recent biographer the architect of the 20th century because he started doing so many new things that very few presidents had thought of before. But the man he succeeded, uh, Grover Cleveland, you know, was a very conservative Democrat, and he did not, he wasn't what you'd call a, um, a flesh presser. He didn't like to go and, and deal with big crowds, and he wanted, he was sort of aloof, as was Benjamin Harris who'd been president before him, that tended to be um, the way that most of the occupants of the office regarded it. They were slightly above the uh, hoi polloi, the hustle and bustle of politics. They, were, they considered themselves to be leaders of the nation. William McKinley believed that as well. How it compares to today, it's almost impossible to... Um, characterize except to say one thing William McKinley did not campaign he sat on his front porch and people came to him so he did not go around making speeches he did not think it was um, it was beneath the view of the presidency to uh, com I guess in a way to commercialize it by getting out and, and touring after he became president he he loved nothing more than to get out and speak to large crowds of people. That was, he was a, a good speaker and he was a charming man. And people were just, you know, crazy about him, except for Leon Shawgosh and a few Democrats. He was, um, his idea of the presidency was also uh, evoked in what he planned to do in his last speech at, um, Buffalo, he talked about what his vision of the future was. He, he had announced that he was not running again. He would not seek a third term. And he talked about the possibility of a world organization like the United Nations. And the, he wanted the Pan-American uh, concept to, to catch on, to grow even more. He encouraged it through his whole presidency. He was, um, I'd say he was the first truly modern president. But the problem with all of these uh, characterizations was the man who took over from him. Everybody remembers Teddy Roosevelt. They think of him as the first modern president. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt's daughter used to say he had to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. He wanted to be the center of attention. And that was uh, very different from William McKinley, who was an extraordinarily private man. He, he loved to speak in public, but he would never talk about himself. Uh, ben, we've got another uh, good question here from LWV, who's asking, who was the assassin and why did he kill him? Why did he want to kill him? You know, a lot of people have wondered about that. They've, most people think that he, he was deranged. He was an anarchist. And he followed the lead of a woman named Emma Goldman, who's quite famous and was, I think, even arrested in the aftermath of... Um, McKinley's assassination, she didn't tell him to do it. But anarchists simply did not want government. And he simply picked McKinley because he was the head of the government. He heard he was coming to Buffalo. He went out and bought a gun a couple of days before, and he went there and, you know, got in line and put a big bandage on his hand so you could see the gun inside it. Of course, they didn't have metal detectors back then and just shot him. But he never he never really explained why he did it. He was tried. He was given 
wasn't really a fair trial. It's kind of a kangaroo court because everybody saw him do it. And they were just trying to convict him so they could execute him and get rid of him. I don't think anyone ever understood, but they just, they think, think he must have been deranged. No other explanation for it. Uh, ben, I, I, earlier I had put into chat that the, your book is available uh, through the publisher at LSU Press, also available at Amazon and at Barnes & Noble. So you can find that easily uh, on there. Um, and and I, I have one other question, uh, which sure. be, relates to the uh, how the presidency was viewed. How about the three branches of government? Uh, was it were they more collegial? Did we have a, a more was it a more friendly time? Did they get along, or were there uh, hints of what we have today, which is the kind of division? How would you uh, look at uh, how Congress and operated at that point in time? It was somewhat more collegial. At least the the parties who were not interchangeable, but who alternated in control of the Congress at the time, they tended to show more respect for um, the roles played by each of um, the branches of government. The president respected Congress because he had actually served in Congress. Not all um, presidents have actually served in the U.S. House. And the Supreme Court was a, a slightly, played a different role back then. It was very conservative court. They rarely did anything that was... Um, progressive or forward thinking. And I think McKinley was only able to appoint one, his first attorney general was his only appointee to the Supreme Court. It was um, politics being politics, it could get nasty at times and it, and it did. But I think in the end, the Congress would always defer to the president, at least the majority of those in Congress would. I said earlier that he did not want to go to war and he really did not want to declare war on Spain. He was forced to by Congress. They were going to declare it against his wishes and he had to go along with it. Once it was declared, he took over and ran it. He almost micromanaged the war. And because he'd been a military officer, I think he knew exactly what he was doing and he successfully prosecuted the shortest war in American history. Uh, ben, last question, and then I'll turn it over to the auditorium, but we're at our 1130 time, and it's been wonderful. Uh, what Are you thinking about writing anything else? Uh, you, I know you're busy with the editing. What about uh, any possible future book in mind or that you'd love to write? <laughs> Well, I've got a couple of books I'd like to write, but I am writing one right now on the history of a small town in New Jersey called Whitesboro, which uh, George White founded after he left Congress as a, a utopian black community. Uh, he brought up uh, settlers from North Carolina, basically. It's a little town in uh, Cape May County, just north of Cape May City. And they carved it out of a forest. They bought about 2,000 acres. It's still there, the town is. And some friends of mine from Whitesboro, whom I've been uh, known for 20 years, asked me if I would write a formal history of the town itself. So that's what I'm doing at the moment in my spare time. Right. Well, you know, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to send an email to the um, participants here that came signed up today and uh, send them the link to that 14 minute uh, video that you sent me. I found that fascinating about Congressman White and about the times. But I want to uh, thank you again and I want to turn it over to the auditorium now, see if there's any last minute question or at least uh, for them to thank you as well. So thank sure. you, Ben. It was a pleasure meeting you. Any questions here? Oh, yes, we're not good. I answered everything. Yay. <laughs> okay. Well, have a good week. Hope to see you next week. 
Arnie, you have a good birthday, okay? All right. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. <clears throat>